episode 74 of the podcast, Safety and Your Animal Career. I want you to be thinking this week about what kind of ways animals get hurt, all the tools that we use, and how they can hurt a dog if behavior problems are causing a dog to jump around, move around. And then also, in the second part, we're going to talk about business costs. What kind of cost is it when somebody gets hurt? or when a dog gets hurt, or when you have to close the business down for a couple days because somebody got hurt. What about long-term injuries? What about career-ending injuries? So this week is all about the beginning, talking with owners and establishing a safety policy and being prepared to answer all of their questions. You're listening to the Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast. I'm Chrissy Newmeyer-Smith. I'm a certified professional groomer, a certified behavior consultant for canines, a certified professional dog trainer, and the owner of Happy Critters in Nashua, New Hampshire. And this, my friends and colleagues, is the podcast where grooming and training meet. Let's talk about safety in our animal careers. So owners, I want you to be listening up because this will help guide you with what your dogs need to know and why it's really important and why you might not get the services that you would like today. (laughs) But so if you are in an animal career, I want you to really be thinking, this is a career. This isn't a job. This is a trade. It's a highly skilled trade. Any of the animal careers are really highly skilled. And I'm going to delve back into my agricultural high school four-year animal science program where, you know what, we just take it really, really seriously. And I think sometimes we fall into these trades. I didn't. Well, I guess I kind of did. It was my first summer job um, internship for school. But but because we kind of fall into it, sometimes we kind of forget. No, we're, we're a legitimate trade. <laughs> we, are, we are highly, highly skilled. And we're often small businesses. So I want us to be taking it seriously and that safety is pretty serious. So where do we start with that? Well, I like to start with our customers and explaining to the humans that we are providing services for what our safety policy is. Now, you can come up with your own safety policy. I'll give you an idea of what mine is. I've had it printed up. Um, well, it, there are a couple of copies on online for the Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast group and the Creating Great Grooming Dogs page, and I'll make sure that they're up there still. And you can just use them straight up if you want. But basically what I tell my customers is for your animal safety, for the safety of your dog, for the safety of your groomer, what what I do is that if a dog becomes overly silly, aggressive, anxious, unruly in any way, I have to slow things down because we are working with sharp equipment. There's a lot of ways for a dog to get hurt, and I need to help them relax and calm down and spend time working on the behavior to make behavioral progress. Your dog might not be completed today, but I'll charge you for the time that I spend working with your dog and working on this. So after explaining that to my customers, what often happens is that now we have some discussions about, well, I mean, it's just a nail trim. How could my dog possibly get hurt? Or I just need that spot around his eyes or that piece on his lip, you know, the part that he bites with, that part. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But it gives us a chance to talk about expectations as well as the idea that we can teach dogs to be good for it. And if you listen to the podcast, there are lots of ways for us to work on that. And, you know, I think that because we can, we should. And as animal caretakers, as as professionals in any of these animal fields, we should be enforcing that. We should be explaining to customers, this is what we need to do, and drawing some hard lines in the sand, like, "Mm, no, I'm not going to throw on a muzzle and grab another person and have three people do a takedown, clamp down nail trim. Like, no, those days are gone. I don't do that. And I used to, I mean, I'm going to admit I wasn't always the, the groomer and trainer that I am today. Um, we did a lot of that in the 80s. And, you know, it's not that it's, 
I'm not making judgment calls about people who still do it that way as much as I'm saying that that's how dogs get hurt. That's how people get hurt. That's how equipment gets broken. That's how owners become really upset that their dog got hurt and they trash your entire business, you know, because Fluffy came in fine and all they did was a nail trim and then they charged me anyway, you know, and, and now he's limping and he has this one nail that bled all over my carpet, you know, like owners are upset with us. They don't understand. So as business owners, small business owners and employees of small businesses um, or even the larger corporations, but I want you to be thinking we need to explain to our customers. So that's where we start. Start with the owners, explain a safety policy, and then talk to them about what kind of things can make grooming unsafe. So I've got a couple of things that I've heard pretty often. And I'm going to go ahead and just debunk some of these because owners say them. Sometimes it's trainers who say it or or veterinarian staff. You know, I want you to be thinking um, these are pretty common questions that we should be prepared to answer. And if you are not a groomer, I want you to think, oh, hey, I had that question too. You know, <laughs> let's all learn together. OK, one of those things I've heard before. Well, aren't there safety tools? Anything that cuts hair can cut skin, anything. And you might think that like brushes and stuff are, are all safe, but a dog that bites the brush or bites a clipper or bites the scissors can hurt their tongue, you know, and then you have a bleeding tongue or a ripped gum or um, a dog that turns fast. Your clipper blade can definitely nick an ear. I think sometimes um, people who are not groomers don't realize that those little clipper blades are still sharp they're sharp. Everything we have is literally sharp. It's going to hurt if, if something gets banged around. And it's not even necessarily just the dog because there have been plenty of times where a dog kicked or did something and the scissors ended up slicing me because I was protecting the dog. You know, like, okay, I moved fast, got my, got my equipment out of the way, not hurt the dog and end up slicing my own thumb open. Um, so safety, safety is super, super important. People ask me, but clippers can't hurt. There are lots of ways that a clipper can hurt. Not only can that blade cut skin because it can cut hair, so therefore it can cut skin. It can catch um, a mole. Um, if it's around a, a bum area, it can sometimes, you know, there's a way to nick a bum. Um, I think that <laughs> you know, every once in a while people are like, I can't understand how that would ever happen. But if you're a groomer and you know what some of these dogs do, it's like, I'm amazed it doesn't happen every day. Not not to any one personal groomer, but like you would think it would be like, you know, one in 50 dogs ends up getting their bum nicked because of behavior problems, right? <laughs> so I want you to be thinking that it's it's a groomer's skill that prevents that, not because it's a safety piece of equipment. And also when we're talking about things like clippers, even if it's not um, a cut, dogs kicking against something metal, that, that hurts. That's bruising. That's ow. Um, I can tell you plenty of times where I've had a clipper knocked into me and yeah, left a bruise, left a mark. So a dog that's kicking and struggling with a pair of clippers up against them and kicking into it is hurting themselves. And it may not be a bruise that you can see or a cut that you can see, but definitely, definitely dogs can hurt themselves with a clipper. Now, here's another one that I've heard pretty often. Um, well, they should have been using ball tip shears. Ball tip shears are safe, right? Now, I want you to be thinking about they are a little bit safer because they don't have that sharp pointy end. However, they are a blade. They are an edge. There's a sharp edge there that cuts hair. And if a dog's moving around or flings itself really fast and, and turns at you really fast, even that, that ball tip end can poke a dog, right? I mean, think about it. Like if you hold those scissors closed and I went and tried to poke at you, you'd dodge it. Like, oh my God, that's going to hurt. Because yes, it's gonna hurt. It's like getting hit with a screwdriver, you know? So be thinking about, we're trying to make the safest possible use of our tools, 
But those behaviors are a big, important part of how well we can keep things safe. Because a dog that's holding still, I can keep safe. A dog that's moving all over the place or flipping around like a trout on a line, I cannot ensure that that dog is going to be 100% safe. So another one that I hear is that brushing and combing. Well, brushes and combs can't, can't hurt dogs. And that's not true either. I mentioned earlier that they can bite a brush or bite a comb. But also, if they're flailing around, next thing you know, that's how um, an eye can get scratched. Like, how would you scratch an eye? Well, because that's one of the areas that owners have so much trouble keeping brushed, that, that they need help clearing out eye boogies and stuff. We're putting our scissors and our shears and our... Um, our clippers and our combs and our brushes right next to eyeballs, right next to it. We're taking that gunk out. Um, and I want you to be thinking that, yeah, that could poke a dog in the eye. That could be a scraped cornea. That could be um, a rip or a tear to an eyelid. There are a lot of ways that anything can hurt a dog, right? Combing, brushes. Now, Here's another one that I've heard, and this one often I'm hearing from trainers. It's like, well, what if groomers just stopped using the tables? Because, you know, like, I just don't even know if groomers need to use the tables and need to use a grooming arm. But now we have a dog that's running around loose. And that means that no other dogs can be out. Ah, that's kind of tricky, isn't it? <laughs> so, you know, we can we can put them on the floor and we can tie them. But a lot of the time what I'm hearing is people worrying about the dogs being tied or having a, a grooming loop. Now, I usually call it a grooming loop. They used to call it a grooming noose, which I think led people to believe that we were actually just choking dogs out with them. But <laughs> the professional term at this point is a grooming loop. But we need a way to have that dog somehow with us. Now, if they're on a table, a lot of dogs have been trained to stay up on the table without the use of a grooming loop. And there are plenty of dogs that I'll groom without the grooming loop just because of their neck problems or um, trachea problems or, or just because they tend to play on the loop. And what I mean by play on the loop... Now, <laughs> I know groomers are going to know what I'm talking about, but it's almost like they decide, hey, cool, I've got this thing that I can hold on to and I now don't even worry about falling off the table. So I'm just going to swing around on this thing and have a good time. Some of those dogs, if you take the grooming loop off, are very still because they realize, whoa, well, I could fall off of this thing. So <laughs> it's one of the tools that can help a dog be calm. It can help a dog be good on the table for us. And I think that because most dogs are walked on leash or walked on harness or a collar or something, they at least have an idea of, oh, I seem to be tied to something. Grooming tables aren't going to go away. So trainers, if you think that, you know, a grooming table is an unrealistic expectation for a particular dog because they are not at that point yet, that's something that we can all talk about and discuss. And a dog by dog basis. But in general, yes, dogs are going to be on grooming tables because the back breaking work of sitting on a floor grooming a dog is really, really not a good long term idea for any groomer. All right? This is a living. We're trying to make a living. Kneeling on the floor next to a dog trying to get things done or sitting on a little stool is back breaking and unnecessary if we have dogs that are prepared for being up on a surface that's at a nice work level. <laughs> so it's another one that we've got here. I have a whole list of them. Um, oh, here's another one that I hear pretty often is like, are loud sounds a source of pain? You know, like they're like, well, can't you just do it without the, without dryers and without the, the shop vac running and all those things? I'm kind of torn on this one. I like to reduce the amount of noise that dogs have to listen to. However, running a shop vac is something that's often necessary during the day at a grooming shop, right? We need to keep our, our work areas clean. So running a shop vac is important. It's not going to go away. We're going to run shop vacs. Dryers, whether it be drying that dog or drying a dog across the room, dryers are important. 
That's part of how we get the job done. So even if your own dog can't handle a dryer, if they're in a shop environment, it's likely that there will be a dryer running in the room with them at some point. So it's some of the expectations we need to think about because we're trying to get these dogs finished and we need to keep the room clean. So using a shop vac or vacuum is going to keep that clean. We need to keep it clean. Clipper vacs, another example. I use a clipper vac when I'm in people's homes because it helps keep everything clean. I want a nice clean work area. This is part of safety. This is part of health and safety and wellness in our field for us and for our dogs and for our customers. In the dryers, there are a lot of dogs that are just too old for me to feel comfortable letting them air dry, you know, or or have health problems. Not every dog can just go home and air dry or their coats are too thick for that or they're going to mat up if they do. So there are a lot of good reasons why drying a dog is part of the expectation of a professional grooming. And we are professionals. So if we explain to owners and answer their questions and be prepared to say, well, yes, they could find that loud noise really difficult. However, I'm going to try to minimize that. And maybe that's a happy hoodie. Maybe that's just using a towel around their head. Maybe that's putting cotton in their ears. There are lots of ways that we can try to minimize that. I actually pick dryers that don't have a higher pitch squeal to them. Like a nice, I like kind of a nice bass. <laughs> I think like the the um, the higher pitch sounds that they irritate me more than the tech talk, right? <laughs> but all of those things are part of what has to get done. And if we explain to owners that this is part of the profession, the business that they are asking to interact with, that they need help from, and this is the way our business works and the reason why we do these things. If you're enjoying this podcast, please remember to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes and tell all of your friends. Now that we've talked about some of the safety concerns and the ways that animals can become hurt or injured at work, (laughs) at our jobs, I want to talk about what do we do when we're talking to our owners and they just won't go for it. They're like, uh, well, you know, I just need his nails done. Are you telling me you can't get his nails done? Well, wh- what does that mean then? What do I need to do? Why do I need to do anything? Right. We need to be able to prepare to talk to them about it and explain to the owners that they have some owner responsibilities. Right. This is where we have to get into this is a business. Right. We're not running a charity. <laughs> and and there are charitable cases. There are times where you will say, you know what, for this particular person. But I want you to think right now, business, business, right? Owners have a responsibility to teach their dogs to be good and make sure that their dogs don't hurt anyone. Make sure your dogs don't hurt people. And we're people too. So if we're telling them we're having an issue with something in particular, it's our duty to make sure that we are trying to give them the resources they need to work on it, whether that be at home or more frequent groomings with us or with a trainer or go to their vet, whatever service we need to direct them to, to help them come up with a solution that's going to work for their dog, work for them, work for us. However, Don't let owners tell you they won't go for it because the truth of the matter is, is that that owner who after hearing how a dog can get hurt, how you can get hurt, how equipment can get broken and still says, I don't care, can go to someone else. Take a deep breath. I know it's a tough one. It's hard. Oh my God. I had so much trouble with this one too, but that person isn't ready to hear it. Tell them what, where they need to go, what they need to do, offer them solutions and be prepared to help out. I won't hire, I won't fire a dog, but I'll fire a customer, right? You have to be on board. Um, now, if they aren't going for it and they're like, no, or you're worried that you're going to lose customers because customers are going to say, I'm not going to spend the extra money. I'm not going to do like that much money for a nail trim, but business again, A two-minute nail trim is your walk-in nail trim. 
that's what you're basing your price on. The snip, 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 snip. Good dog. Okay, back to your daddy. And I take the money and we talk a little bit and off they go. If it takes three people 10 minutes, that's a half hour of your shop time down the drain, you know, for someone who's like, $15 for a nail trim and you didn't even get them perfect and now my dog's limping or whatever their complaint is, right? That's not good for your business. It's not good for your bottom line. So I want you to remember, this one's a tough one too, because we are such dog lovers. Dogs are a luxury. You do not need to own a dog. I have a dog right now who's trying desperately hard to get into the mic here and talk to you guys, but um, dogs are a luxury. They, they're our family members, but they are a luxury. And dog grooming by a professional is a luxury service for a luxury item. Take it in for a minute and really think about that. They can get clippers and do it themselves. They choose not to, right? I mean, if they don't really care if it takes three people to hold their dog down and every nail bleeds as long as all those nails are short, they could be doing that with a bunch of drunken buddies in their garage, right? They choose to have somebody else do it because they know it's hard work or they just don't want to do it and they found somebody who will, right? I think a lot of small business owners and a lot of groomers get bullied by this. Don't let people push you around. Say, well, that's not what I do here. <laughs> you know, we're going to have to teach them to be good. And um, yeah, I might not get the whole nail trim done today. Let me explain to you the way that I'm going to make progress and how I'm going to measure my progress and how we're going to work toward a dog who's going to let us do it and let us do it properly and safely for their lifetime. And here is some things for you to work on or things for me to do or, you know, professionals you can go to, right? We're a resource and we have to serve our customers. But if they are not willing, they can do it themselves. <laughs> and I, right? Be thinking about that. Now, here is another part. I want you to be thinking about your safety policy and safety for your career as business costs because a dog that gets injured, even with a business insurance deductible, you have some vet bills to pay. I believe my deductible for my business is 500 And knock on wood, I am actually going to knock on wood. Knock on wood for luck, right? I haven't had to put in a claim. But it's there. So even if I ran up a huge vet bill or something, I'm still going to have to pay some of that out of pocket. Now, here's another part of business costs. If something unsafe happens, bad press, right? That owner's like, Fluffy got hurt. How did Fluffy get hurt? You know, why is he, why is he sore today? He's limping. They must have done something to him. Even though they told you, oh yeah, he's super aggressive. He doesn't let us touch his feet, you know, and they, they know like, yeah, just pile people on him. They aren't going to remember that when their dog gets hurt. It, it just, it's going to be bad press. It's going to be, they hurt my dog. And in this day and age, things like that can destroy your business, whether it was meant to or not. All right. Now here's another part. I want you to be thinking about injuries to yourself, injuries to your employees, right? Some of these injuries could be long-term. I had a dog jump out of the tub when I worked on a grooming van, a big Akita, and he decided he was going to jump past me when I was trying to lift him and just tweaked my back the wrong way. And man, I thought that was going to be a career ending injury. That was nasty. That was not fun at all. And you know what? I tried to finish that dog up and I brought him back to the house damp and she was mad that he was damp. <laughs> He's not even fully dry. I mean, I'm barely standing up straight. And I'm like, I just hurt my back. I did my best. Um, you know, I already talked to the boss. She's going to tell you about it because I was working on somebody else's van. You know, we're, we'll take care of it. Um, you know, do whatever we need to do. She was upset, right? That people have no idea that we can get hurt. And sometimes they just don't care. Don't cater to them. Do you know how many awesome owners there are out there? Spend your time and your effort 
looking for the people who are willing to take your advice and willing to work with you because an injury that's long term could be career changing. I don't know what I would want to do if I wasn't grooming dogs or training dogs. Like, hmm, what would I move on to next if a, if a back injury really took me out? That would be devastating, right? Think about times when um, a dog bites. Like, if they bite your scissoring hand, you know? I mean, I think people forget that some of these things could be career-ending injuries. This is about safety, behavior, and safety for your animal career, for your long-term professional wellness. And I want you to also think that even if you just get a, a, a small minor injury, you're going to need time to heal. What happens to the rest of the dogs that day? Let's say you get bit in the hand and, and um, you've got three dogs that are half finished and you have to call the owners and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't get them finished today. And I have to reschedule everyone for tomorrow and everyone for the next day because I can't, my hand's going to be in this brace for however long, right? Be thinking about that. You're displacing a whole bunch of, of owners and you are probably losing a lot of money. You're going to reschedule them later, but still those few days of, oh, by the way, now you're just not making money. <laughs> Or your employee is not there to make money for the business, right? Your business loses out, you lose out, you need time to heal, and you got hurt. Don't, don't worry about if you're going to offend an owner when you talk to them about the kind of problems their dog has, because you should not be getting hurt at work. All right, now, once I started my own business, my times that I've been hurt at work... <laughs> Um, went down dramatically because I'm able to say, hey, this is my safety policy. This is how I feel about it. This is the way we proceed. And I have a success rate. Ah, can't talk today. Success rate <laughs> with helping dogs learn to be good for it and become long-term good, solid dogs to work on. Um, now, I've had customers that were not on board and I said, no. Oh, all right. But, you know, you've already been turned away from a whole bunch of groomers and I'm turning you away too, because when you're ready to take this seriously, call me. And they never did. So maybe they found somebody else to do it and then the next person and then the next person. Who knows? But my goal for all of us is to be thinking about these are really important safety issues. And when dogs are having a behavior issue on the table, we need to be able to address it so that we can maintain safety. Um, and it's not because groomers are doing mean, awful things. <laughs> you know, I think trainers and vets sometimes throw groomers under the bus. You know, um, I'll tell you, there was once where someone was telling me about their last groomer and oh, the last groomer nicked his ear. And even the vet said it was probably something sharp. I'm like, during a haircut? Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, it was probably something sharp. They're like, why would they have something sharp near my dog's ear? Even the vet thought that was awful. I'm like, okay, we need to stop throwing each other under the bus. That needs to stop. Haircuts are done with sharp things. <laughs> dogs that struggle pull their little legs, you know, and especially some of the small dogs. You know, I think sometimes people are like, he's only 10 pounds. How could you possibly have trouble managing a 10 pound dog or a five pound dog? Like, Because they're fragile and they will pull on their own leg until it rips off if you let them. So when we talk about our career and safety and setting some real boundaries and some real guidelines for people, because you should not be getting hurt at work. That's not what we should be doing. We need to be able to teach these dogs to be good, help our owners understand what their options are, how this can happen, how we can work with them, and then come up with ways to manage the behavior while we're retraining and have a nice, safe work environment. Because the thing I want to leave you with right now is imagine, imagine if you will, close your eyes, take a deep breath, imagine every single dog that you groom being good. That's pretty cool, huh? Right? 
Like the only wild cards I have are new customers. And then I'm prepared and I've already talked to them about my safety policy. All my regulars, they're awesome. <sighs> and it feels so good. And that's what I want for you. Like, okay, imagine the trims you can get done if your dogs are actually holding still. You know, the paintings you can do if your canvas isn't bouncing around trying to hurt you. <laughs> so that's my big one this week. It's sort of a, a place to start if you are new to the podcast, because, you know, now we're up here at episode 74. But our weekly action step this week is to think about how life changing it would be if every single dog that you work with either was already really, really great behavior or learning to be good and the owners were on board and everything was perfect. Just live the dream. We can live the dream. If you'd like more information, you can find me at Chrissy at happycritters.net, um, happycrittersdogtraining.com, or you can join the Facebook group, Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast, or the Facebook page, Creating Great Grooming Dogs. I really look forward to hearing from you.